Jackson, Jackson Holiday, one of one. That card was pulled by Filth Bomb Breaks, and they, I am a big fan of them actually. Um, because Mike, who I'm trying to think, he he had but he's been on TikTok for like as long as I have. Like I remember he was one of the accounts. He was one of the accounts that I remember um was on there when I was first getting on there. Um let's see. We'll zoom in here on the car so you can take a closer look. Yeah, the one of one Jackson Holiday. He was the number one pick from this last draft. Uh let's see. Actually, I'm gonna tweet at them just you know chatting about the chatting about the card because um let's see feature shared as i don't really want to do that but yeah so like they i the live stream now um yeah they they were on tiktok like as when I was on, when I was first getting on TikTok, like I remember I'm trying to think of like what the, because it wasn't, they changed their name. I don't remember what they changed it to or what they changed it from. Let's see. Let me go to their Instagram really quick and see if I can um, see if it says there. Oh, maybe it was foul line baseball. I think, uh, I think that might've been it. Was that, I don't, I don't remember exactly what their brain was before, but now they are, Filth Bomb Breaks, which they're like a guys from New York. Um, Mike, who's like super, super cool. I've talked to him a couple times. And when I first saw him getting into sports cards, like that, I was like super excited because like they were, like I said, they were one of the first TikTok accounts that was like a sports account that I remember following that was like talking a lot about sports. So like it was cool to see them get into sports cards and they shifted. I think that they were more of like a content co- content company. Um, and now there are, now they're doing, um, breaks, which is cool. Um, I think another probably talk about in a little bit is like breaking on TikTok is, is it looks like it's no more, but either way, that's something I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But like, so this card, the Jackson holiday, which I was sort of surprised that Jackson holiday actually went number one, actually wait, um, 2022 MLB MLB draft, which uh, yeah, Jackson Holiday is Matt Holiday's son. Um, who is he? Matt Holiday, if you remember, he played for yep, number one pick. I thought that he, I thought that Drew Jones was going to go number one. Um, but because if it, the MLB prospect tracker says that. Actually, I'll just pull this up to share this tab. Um, let me just make sure we're. Let me see if I can make this a little bit larger. See how that looks. Um, nope. Let's just actually. Let's just do this. Yeah. So, Jackson Holiday. Um, he was, I guess, number two on their ranking, and Drew Jones was number one. Like I said, I was a little bit surprised that Drew Jones didn't go number one and that Jackson Holiday did. I guess maybe uh, the Orioles looked at it and said they wanted an infielder rather than an outfielder, I guess. But, like, I mean, Drew Jones, like, you look at players that are this young. Like, these players were both born in 2003. Like, I get that, you, and they're, they're both coming out of high school. Like, you don't necessarily want to say, like, hey, we're drafting you and you're switching positions. But, like, if you're if you're a – if you're a team that's drafting the number one pick, I don't know, but you know, if you're drafting drew Jones, like he's obviously a phenomenal athlete, like and Jackson holiday too. Like who's to say that these players can't switch positions. Like, and I, I get that that's maybe a little bit of a big ask um, is for them to switch positions that they kind of played throughout their career. But it's like, all they've really played is like, you know, they probably played AU. They probably, pl- they probably played, um, like upper level, like high level high school baseball. Um, but it's not like it, they're, they're only, you know, 18, 19 years old. So it's like, who's to say whether they are able to switch positions or not. I don't know, but either way. So like I said, let me switch back to the, 
card here. Let me switch back. Um, yeah, so number one pick, Jackson Holiday, Matt Holiday's son. Oh, Drew Jones is also Aaron Jones' son, which that's maybe another uh, fun little tidbit there. Um, Aaron Jones, the Braves legend. Uh, but yeah, so number one pick, uh, Jackson Jackson Holiday, Super Fractor pulled. We've seen over the past few years a lot of these like big Super Fractors being pulled. And I think it's one of the cool things about – social media and cards nowadays it's like we get to see these cards getting pulled where in the past the only way we would have known that a card like this would have been pulled is like if it's sold on ebay or if it's sold through like golden auctions or some other auction house like uh let's i'm gonna switch out of the the other the other fun picture that they posted yeah there's mike there he is what a guy um but yeah they and i guess the crazy i mean the crazy story is that like the box was the last box of the case. Um, and I guess it was like the last box of the night that they were trying to pull. And then next thing you know, the card that's coming out is like this like monster card, obviously probably the biggest card from last year's Bowman draft. Um, yeah. I mean, it has to be cool. It's the number one, number one pick. And I mean, I don't know. Let me see. Let me see where Jackson Holiday is ranked. Um, draft, no. Top 100. Uh, Jackson. So Jackson Holiday, I mean, he's the 12th overall prospect right now. Um, still in single A. I don't know if he is at spring training. Let's see. Jackson Holiday. Spring training. But yeah, I guess he, he got invited to spring training. That's cool. Um, but he's in single A. So let's see, he's 19. So that would mean I bet you he he probably makes his – oh, actually, you know what? They have the projected when he makes his debut. So 2025 is when he's projected to make his debut. Uh, let's look at the Orioles roster. Baltimore – uh more orioles um depth chart yeah depth chart i guess let's switch over the screen actually switch to the screen yeah here we go baltimore orioles depth chart let's just look at that we got the active 40 man depth chart this isn't exactly what i was looking for i was looking for the positions um So shortstop, yeah, because I guess – well, and also the other thing is, like, if he's going to be a shortstop, um, Jackson Holiday, they already have sort of like a young – oh, shoot. They already have a – actually, I'm just going to switch back to – because I'm trying to switch between tabs here. They already have like Gunnar Henderson, who I believe is in. I believe that he's in the league now. I don't think he's on. Oh, so he's the number one. Oh my God. Wow. Such an idiot. So he's the number one overall prospect right now. Well, and it also says shortstop third baseman. So like their third base. Oh, what the heck? It says third base. Okay. So yeah. So maybe that's why they looked 2025. So that's two years from now. So like, I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if like next year, depending on how well he plays this year. Uh, Cause that's one thing that I think too, that the MLB needs to maybe do a little bit of a better job at is figuring out how to get, we're going to switch back to the card here, figuring out how to get uh, their players up into the league a little bit faster. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's even like they need to, maybe they need to, maybe they need to make a rule where it's like, you have to be, 19 or 20 to get to be drafted or to be signed to a team. Cause it's like, I get that. Like at 18 MLB teams want to get these players experience in pro ball, uh, you know, spring training, obviously great for Jackson, Jackson holiday. Gunnar Henderson is number one overall prospect. I think that then that, then that probably means that like, 
let's see, probably by the first month or two of the season, he'll be off that list because if he's in the MLB, so the top three prospects right now are actually all, uh, so let's actually switch over to the tab here. So the top three prospects are actually all in the league, and it looks like they're all going to be starting this year, 21, 22, 21. I, you know, I, I understand that they want to get these players at that 21 to 22 range, maybe 20 for at some examples. Like I think Juan Soto was in the league at 19 or 20. Um, let's see if there's anybody else. I mean, I mean, the Orioles also have like a pretty crazy farm system right now of like young players. So it's going to be interesting to see sort of what they do if they try and, I mean, I don't even know. The Orioles are such an interesting franchise because it's like they're in the, obviously in the Red Sox, Yankees, Devil Rays, well, Rays now, um, Blue Jays division. Like it, it seems like at any time, like that could be the best division in baseball. But it's like some teams, I think, within that division, at some times throughout the season, like you get to the point where it's like, if you know you're not going to make the playoffs, like what do you end up doing? Like, do you want to trade for a player that could maybe be you? Obviously, you want to, you don't want to be trading for like rental players, but like you want to maybe trade for or or trade your young prospects for maybe you you maybe want to trade at somebody like a Jackson Holiday for I don't know like. And, and this is sort of speculative, but and, and who knows who would what team would really do this? But maybe look at like a uh, if I were a GM, I'm obviously not, so I don't know how to run a team. But like maybe you trade your number one, your number one pick for somebody who's more MLB ready. I don't know, maybe, maybe not, because I also, also at the same time I look at it and say like if if MLB teams could market their players correctly. Um, then this would be a different conversation. Kamikaze said, I've been looking for looking to buy some baseball rookies that are having hot springs. But I, yeah, exactly. It's like it's like Pete Alonzo, for example. He was like 23 when he was a rookie in 2019. Aaron Judge is another example. He's like old, it, it old, you know, considering whatever, uh, not old from a actual real life perspective, but like from a sports perspective. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll leave this question out to sort of the chat too. Like if you, if you're buying MLB players, leave a one in the chat. If you buy prospects and rookies and leave a two, if you are, if you're buying more, you know, older players, like, cause I think it goes back to that conversation we had earlier on in the show about like John Moran. It's like, there's so much potential with these rookies, but there's also a ton of like, there could be a ton of downside. Uh, there could be like a ton of like, you never know what ends up happening with these players. Like if they, if they end up making it, if they end up not making it, like who really knows, you know um, it's all, it's all kind of perspective too. Like when you're looking at, you know, rookies, younger players, all that kind of stuff. Um, I do think there was like also like I think Mike and them were talking about not there was like a controversy where they weren't like people were posting the card I think and they were cutting this piece out and and I mean I think there was also like um, I think there was something like this that happened a couple weeks ago with another. Twitter account like where because I saw um, a couple people talking about it and like I don't know I mean yeah I guess it's I guess it can be annoying and I mean I think if you I think for these guys like they are they're sort of um, I think that they are uh, what's it called they are doing it maybe ironically i think like they're not actually serious i think like they are kind of making a joke out of it um because of what happened before because like i think it was c Blaze potentially that did post this card and didn't tag the didn't tag them and then also cut out the bottom thing it's like it's like you 
it, it doesn't, you know, that type of thing doesn't really make that much sense. Like just, just give, I don't know, just give credit to the person, like just tag them. If you're going to use their stuff on, uh, like Twitter or Instagram or whatever. I mean, I, I'm, I feel like I try and do that as best I can. Like if I'm pulling an image from eBay, I, I may or may not do that. Like, but that's because on eBay they're, you know, we're not, uh, you can see people's accounts on eBay, but at the same time, it's like, it's not like their social media or anything is really connected. Some people market on eBay pretty well and they do use their social media on there. But like if eBay, and I actually think if, if eBay did that, I think that that would be kind of interesting. Um, if they included social media, maybe potentially, I guess they're kind of a marketplace, so it's not really, they don't really care that much. It's not like a lot of eBay obviously is kind of the biggest marketplace for us, but uh, as card people, but I think like if, I don't know if maybe like golden or com C maybe potentially too, like I just feel like there's a social aspect that some of these marketplaces are missing. They're missing the, the, social sharing aspect of cards i think somehow like because i think this this industry of all the industries in my opinion is one that the that social media has grown sports cards more than any company really has grown sports cards like uh the amount of people who have card accounts that post about cards every single day that marketing is like so vast. That's like, that's like invaluable to these card companies, in my opinion. Like there is, there is th the amount of money that tops and Panini upper deck leaf, maybe too. the amount of money that they don't have to spend on social media is like astronomical. Like it's, it's really like something where it's like, from a, I, I come from a sort of a marketing background, but it's like, it's, it's a crazy amount that these companies don't have to spend on social media because they, you know, because, because people are doing the marketing for them. And I think it goes back to Michael Rubin uh, from fanatics was on the Nelk boys podcast a couple of weeks ago. And he was saying that like the sports cards became popular by accident i think was his quote and i i couldn't agree more with that it's like sports cards the sports cards have have done everything to get in their own way when it comes to like growing in popularity and like doing all these things because we have some scan we have scandals and stuff maybe maybe more than other industries i mean i really think social or i really think sports cards is such a unique industry where it's it's a business, but it can also be for fun, but it can also be like there are tons of different businesses you can do within sports cards. Like you can be a content creator, you can buy and sell, you can do breaks, you can do um, you can go to card shows and buy and sell at card shows. Or if you want to just buy cards and sell them, it can be a self-sustaining hobby. Like if you do enough um, research, like, and you learn about the cards you can buy and sell. And that can fund, that can fund your whole hobby. It's really one of the only hobbies that you can do. Like, you know, just thinking of other random things, you know, like Legos, for example, like you can't really buy it. You could, you probably could buy and sell Legos, but like you can't open Legos and then sell it like cards. You can, Oh, you can buy a box of cards and sell it. Um, I'm just trying to think of other like random hobbies. I mean, that's really sneakers. I guess you could potentially make it a self-sustaining hobby, but it's like cards are just, it's, it's such a, it's such an interesting opportunity for people to run a business within the business. And I don't think the marketplaces are, I think the marketplaces could do a better job at, including, you know, some sort of social aspect when it comes to, uh, the, 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 your account. Like, I think like if, I don't know if, um, 
Com C, for example, like everybody has an account on there. Like you have a username. If you could link your username with your Instagram, like you would then be able to maybe share directly on Instagram from your account or whatever. Like, I just think that there is a good opportunity for whichever, whatever company wants to try and do it. Um, I think that they can, and it's going to help them when it comes to the integration of their platform in this business in the long term, because I think social media, like I said, is the biggest catalyst when it comes to marketing of sports cards without the top companies in the in the industry really having to do any type of marketing themselves. Like I think Tops definitely has done a better job over the past few years. I think Panini has done an okay job. I do think that there are some times where I think Panini could do a better job. I think Panini reposting people's Instagram stories is a good step in the right direction. But at the same time, like if that's all that they're doing, I don't know. Like I just think that there could be more. Like I think Tops is Tops is figuring out how to tops is figuring out how to craft a better story around the marketing of their cards. Um, and I think that's one thing that I don't know if it's, um, I don't know if it's just fanatics that's doing that, or if someone came into tops and their initiative was that they want to, they want to create the top social media to be more engaging and more like, fun to go to like because that's one of the other things like a lot of people use social media as a outlet for you know news or they use it for fun so like if your social media or your twitter account is just like here's this new thing like go out and buy it it's like no one wants to see that like no one cares but like tops i think did a cool they one of the cool projects that they did on their twitter account recently uh was when they came out with the when they came out, let me see. Yeah, when when Tops came out with the like, they came out with like a reimagined 1952 set that was like they played off the f- rumor that like there were tons of the cards that were in the water. So like their whole social media story that they created around that was like was like a water themed. Inst- was they changed their whole Instagram account to like a water themed account with like the you know they sure they were still trying to sell the cards on the account but the stuff that they were featuring was like the cards were underwater and they had like these water textures and they changed their whole account based on the based on um the cards that were out and i don't necessarily know i don't know if anybody at these companies are watching my videos or they've seen my videos but that was something that i brought up like months ago like i was like i wish that they would brand their social medias when they have a big product coming out the way that like wwe uh the way that they change kind of their marketing and their their aesthetic on their social medias when they have like a pay-per-view coming out like every new pay-per-view that wwe is sort of changing changing what they're doing like when it comes to their graphic design choices and stuff along those lines so like uh i mean i think tops did a great job i don't i think that they've done a pretty good job with the release of flagship i think i guess there isn't necessarily like a thing to it. Like, i'll be interested to see when like gypsy queen comes out or no i think they might have got rid of when like alan and ginter comes out or um like when bowman maybe comes out like what they choose to do with social media at that point because i like i said With WWE, every month there's a new pay-per-view. With sports cards, every month there's like a new big release that's coming out for whether it's baseball or, you know, once they get basketball or whatever. And it's going to be interesting to see how they market all three of the sports once they eventually get all the sports. But either way, I think like, like I said, every month there's a new product coming out the same way that like every month there's a new um, WWE pay-per-view. So like I think that tops has a really cool opportunity the same way the WWE has that opportunity to create their social media and write the story that is that product. And, you know, I think that they've also done that. I think there's a website now. It's called like ripped. I think tops ripped where they're doing sort of a, a retrospective look and creating around the products that are coming out. And I, I think that's a phenomenal idea as well. Like, I mean, I think the educational aspect of sports, like sports cards, for example, uh, Right now, here's my big thing. Right now, the story of sports cards is being written. Like, I think that there has been blogs, there's been content that's been created, but I think 
what's going on right now, all the content creators that are creating content right now in 10 years, those are going to be the stories that are going to be told about cards from this era. So I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing necessarily. I, for one, can only really, I can only, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I can only affect the content that I'm creating. There's some content that I don't necessarily love. There's some, there's, there's some content that I wish maybe had a little bit of a different, you know, slant to it, I guess, if that's one way to put it. But either way, I think the stories of sports cards being told right now, and I think 10 years down the road, people are going to look, be able to look back at the, the people who were documenting and creating content around these times because for cards, that wasn't always the thing. Like, I think, I think the example that I've used occasionally is like, um, the, the right now, social media and cards are in a similar boat to when fantasy sports went from pen and paper to online. So we're in those early stages still, in my opinion. I don't know. Maybe you could ask you could ask 10 other people. I'm sure they'll have a different opinion. But I think we're we're in the early stages of sports cards being online. Like eBay, for example, has, you know, that's not it's not like eBay's been around for decades and decades. Like it was created in the 90s. So it's like we're still in early stages of online selling. So it's like we're in those early stages of like when fantasy sports went from pen and paper to online. So I'm going to at least try to create the content that I think hopefully 10 years down the road, someone will look back and say, that was really informational. <laughs> I guess that was a good way of documenting it. Like it wasn't over the top. It wasn't clickbaity or whatever, you know, there's obviously clickbait that you have to do because that's just the way it is nowadays, unfortunately with content on social media, but it's like, hopefully down the road, people can look back at some of the content and stuff that's being created and say like, these were good stories that people told. These were interesting stories. Um, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I think it's going to be interesting, uh, interesting down the road.